of the Western Balkans. <laughs> we now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. John Lamont. Thank you. On Tuesday, Health Secretary Alec Neill said satisfaction with our NHS has increased by 20% over the last seven years, and nearly two thirds of people in Scotland claim to be satisfied with our health service. On the same day, the outgoing head of BMA Scotland, Dr. Brian Keithley, said, and I quote, what I have seen over the past five years is a continuing crisis management of the longest car crash in my memory, and it is time for our politicians to face up to some very hard questions. I agree with Brian Keithley. He speaks for NHS staff all over the country. Could the First Minister tell the people of Scotland why the leader of Scotland's doctors is wrong? First Minister. Well, let's uh, deal with the a question of satisfaction of the public in the National Health Service. That, that wasn't an opinion poll or, or some snap survey. That was the Social Attitudes Survey for Scotland, which is the most detailed assessment of social attitudes uh, in the country. Uh, and what that showed uh, and demonstrated is that satisfaction with the National Health Service has risen to 61 per cent. Uh, by way of comparison, when Joanne Lamont was a minister, it was 45 per cent. Yeah in 2006. So when Jan Lamont starts by saying it was a claim of Alec Neil, it's actually the Social Attitudes Survey for Scotland, the most detailed assessment of public attitudes. And that compares directly the satisfaction with our National Health Service today and the satisfaction which was when Labour were in power. And it's been in a strongly rising trend. Now, as far as Dr Brian Keithley is concerned, he wants to have more funds for the National Health Service. And he makes an entirely reasonable point that despite the fact that the National Health Service has been protected its budget in real terms, it is under sustained pressure because of the rising demand for health services. How do I know that? Because Brian Keithley said in GMS on the 24th of June, I accept the SNP has done as much within the Barnet formula and resources that are available to them. So when Joanne Lamont says that, the, that Brian Keithley says the NHS is under pressure, as indeed he did, then let's remember he also said and accepted that we are doing everything we can within the resources that are available to us to provide these resources for our National Health Service. And that may be one reason why satisfaction with the National Health Service is, is on a rising trend. And the other reason, of course, will be that the people of Scotland understand the work and performance of our people in the National Health Service who are delivering such an excellent result, even under circumstances of pressure. John Lamont. Dr Brian Keithley is a member of staff in the Health Service. You ought to listen to what he is saying. Not to pick one thing he has said, but reflect on everything that he says. With accident and emergency targets missed, with cancer targets missed, with care for the elderly in crisis, the man who represents Scotland's doctors, Brian Keithley, said, and I quote, the current service is teetering on the edge of collapse. The leader of Scotland's doctor said, my main regret is that I have not been able to do more than act as a deck chair attendant on the good ship NHS Titanic. So could the First Minister tell the people of Scotland why the leader of Scotland's doctors is wrong and he is right? First Minister. Well, uh, can I offer another quote from Brian Keefley, uh, again in the same interview, which Joanne Lamont doesn't want to accept, but the, the quotes are here. He says, clearly my target is not the current Cabinet Secretary, my target is the political classes in Scotland. And the point that he's making is that health resources are under pressure because of rising demand. Now, he accepted the point that we've done everything we can under the constraints of the Barnett formula to protect the National Health Service. I think we're entitled to ask, would that have been done if the Labour Party had been in power over these last seven years? Well, we know it wouldn't have been done in 2007 because Jack McConnell said the NHS would just have to cut its cloth and wouldn't have access to the consequentials. We doubt that it would have been done in 2011 because the Labour Party refused to commit to the resources in real terms. And if we want evidence of the Labour Party in power, then just look to Wales, suffering the same stresses 
under the Barnett formula of Scotland and on every measurement turning in a worse health performance. So does Joanne Lamont not accept the connection between the resources available to us under the Barnett formula and the ability to fund the National Health Service to the degree that Brian Keefley and all of us would want? And isn't that an argument for having access to Scotland's resources so as we can deliver that desirable outcome? Joanne Lamont. Of course, under uh, the First Minister's prescriptions for Scotland, we would have less money to spend on public services. And while his friends in the back benches applaud that oft heard script, he should reflect that that script he trots out every time the NHS is heard sounds very much like complacency for staff and patients who live in the real world and are dealing with these problems daily. Because we have been warning the First Minister about the mounting problems in our NHS for the last two years, and every time we get the same old script. But he can't keep ignoring the reality. Brian Keesley, the leader of Scotland's doctors, said, We have a crisis. We have a crisis of out of hours health provision that sees huge and unacceptable queues at A&E departments. We see reports of geriatric provision coming under increased criticism through inadequate care packages and increasing bed blocking. And at the same time, GPs coping with a 20% increase in workload. He then continued. We see vital cancer treatments delayed because of unsustainable cost, and we see cracks emerging in hospital food, cleanliness, staff shortages and vacancies within both the consultant body and GP trainees. He finished. And how has the Scottish Government responded? It talks of seven-day provision at a time when we have an inadequate five-day service. First Minister... Those are the problems that our NH staff are facing every day. So can I ask him, what is the First Minister's plan for the NHS? First Minister. Well, our plan is to continue to fund the NHS in Scotland to the maximum degree, something that the Labour Party, neither in Scotland or Wales, would commit it to. Our plan is to have access to the resources of Scotland so that we can move beyond austerity and have a proper, responsible, reasonable increase in public spending, as John Swinney outlined. We know that Brian Keefley accepts that we are doing everything we can within the Barnett formula. That is a reason to break free of the Barnett formula and have access to the resources of Scotland. But I don't accept Joanne Lamont's prescription about that, the accident and emergency and the cancer waiting list. Now let me say, we are acting to improve performance in the accident and emergency. We are acting, as Alec Neil announced this week, to improve meeting our cancer targets. We are particularly concerned that we have moved below the 62-day target. But the Labour Party never once exactly. achieved that target. Yeah. Not once in office did the Labour Party achieve the 62-day cancer target. Yes, we believe that 93% of people being seen within four hours in accident and emergency isn't good enough. But the Labour Party in power when Joanne Lamont was a minister proclaimed that 87% was an excellent performance. So given, as the Social Attitude Survey demonstrates, that public satisfaction with the National Health Service is rising, given that we committed, which Labour wouldn't do, to protect the National Health Service budget in, in real terms, and given that our performance, under pressure though the NHS undoubtedly is, is better than when the Labour Party were in power, what possible credibility has a minister in the last government complaining about the situation when public finances are under pressure when they couldn't run Scotland when public finances were plentiful. To add, the problem, the problem for the First Minister is the First Minister wants to make this a cheap political debate between himself and my sister. And I'll deal with that. That's not a problem. Order! Order! That's not a problem. That's Order. not a problem. Settle down. Order. Miss Graham. Miss Graham. That's not a Ms. problem. Lamont. We can do that. We can do that, but we let the people of Scotland down every time we settle for that. 
every time on the big issues when we settle for that or saying that the only solution is independent, when not I raise these questions, but the head of the BMA raise it, nurses raise it, patients raise it, people out there in our constituencies who every day are being let down by a, a, a government not interested in NHS, not interested in anything, but not interested in anything but the obsession that took them into politics in the first place. So every time, on behalf of the people of Scotland, when I have asked the First Minister about blanket shortages, unacceptable waiting times in A&E, a lack of access to cancer drugs, cancer waiting times, elderly people left in trolleys for hours, older people getting 15 minute care visits, doctor shortages, anything about the NHS, and we've seen it again today. The First Minister has told me People are happy with their health service. It's getting privatised in England, and it would be worse if we were Welsh. Inadequate answers to serious questions. The First Minister has told us. The First Minister has told us. The First Minister has told us. This is a really serious issue for people of Scotland, and it deserves better than that. The First Minister has told us he's a plan A, B, C, D, E and F for a currency in an independent Scotland. Does he not realise that what Scotland wants, what our hard-working doctors and nurses are demanding from him, is any kind of plan for the NHS today? First Minister. Uh, I, I see that Jan Labbott doesn't think it's important that uh, the NHS in Scotland has been kept in public hands and not subjected to the disintegration. <laughs> Very interesting. You see, Dr Keefley, in his speech to BMA Scotland this week, didn't say that. What he said is, quote, what is totally clear is that the National Health Service we have in Scotland is fundamentally different from that in England in terms of philosophy and organisation. North of the border, we have been spared the spectacle of a huge organisation being thrown in the air with the only speculation as a guide to where the pieces might land. We have avoided wholesale reorganisation, the NHS manager games of musical chairs and the worst successes of the use of the NHSS as a party political football and for that we must be thankful. So if Brian Keithley thinks that's important, given that Joanne Lamont cited him, why don't the Labour Party think it's important? Is it perhaps because Andy Burnham was talking about having a common health service across the UK and leave the health service in Scotland to the tender mercies of the privatisation agenda being pursued at Westminster? Now, Joanne Lamont doesn't want to talk about what the public think about the National Health Service, because the increase in National Health Service performance in terms of accident emergency and in cancer care is reflected in the 21% increase in public satisfaction. 85% of Scottish inpatients say overall care and treatment was good or excellent. 87% rated the performance of their GP surgery as good or excellent. 84% of social care users rated their overall care and support as good good or excellent. That is real people in the real world, understanding the commitment and strength for people in the National Health Service, supported by a government which has funded the health service in real terms and which would be able to do a great deal more in an independent Scotland. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First uh, Minister. No plans in uh, the near future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We end this a parliamentary session in a familiar place. We have the SNP blind to the very real risks involved with leaving the UK, and we have independent expert analysis pointing those risks out. To take an example just from this morning, a new report from the Scotland Institute, which has examined the blunt financial truths that would face a separate Scotland. We may not like to hear it, but having interviewed the main credit rating agencies, they say an independent Scotland is, and I quote, likely to end up with a much lower credit rating and significantly higher borrowing costs than currently enjoyed within the union. Does the First Minister agree with this report that there is a real pounds and pens cost to separation? First Minister. 
I don't think that credit rating is the better together strongest suit, given that famous leaflet of the AAA rating, yes. which was published only weeks before the AAA rating disappeared, and given the speculation on rising interest rates that are as much uh, about at the present moment. But let's talk about the credit rating agencies directly. Even excluding North Sea oil output and calculating per capita GDP, only looking at onshore income, Scotland would qualify for our highest economic assessment. That's Standards and Poor's on the 27th of February this year. Moody's, scoring for the economic strength of an independent Scotland would like to fall somewhere in the high range. We know the growth rate of Scotland, the volatility of growth. There is limited range of outcomes for GDP per capita, but on all possible outcomes point to Scotland being amongst the wealthiest sovereign nations in the world. Page 15 of the Moody's report. So even if people in the ratings agencies, not known for their sunny optimism about the prospects of any country, if they say this about Scotland and point out that Scotland is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, cannot the Scottish Conservatives in any of their manifestations realise the potential of this economy and have confidence in our ability to marshal these natural resources, combine them with the talents of people and live up to the excellence of the assessments even from the credit ratings. Davidson. As the First Minister well knows, Standard & Poor didn't give an independent Scotland its highest credit rating. An economic assessment is only one of the measures it uses for it, and it's misrepresenting their views to say so. But it sounds to me, it sounds to me that the First Minister thinks that the Scotland Institute from that answer is wrong, which means that they join a long list. Just since January, since January, he has stood up here and told us that the former Director General of the Legal Service of the EU Council is wrong, that the Governor of the Bank of England is wrong, that the First Minister of Wales, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Shadow Chancellor, the Institute of Directors, the Confederation of British Industry is wrong, that the Barclays Chief Executive is wrong, that the Chief Executive of Standard Life that the Chief Executive of the Royal Bank of Scotland, that the Chief Executive of BP, of ASDA, are wrong. He stood up here and said that the Scottish Government's own oil figures were wrong, that the Office of Budget Responsibility was wrong. He said that Keith Cochrane, the Chief Executive of the Weir Group, was wrong, that Scottish financial enterprise was wrong, that Scottish engineering was wrong. He said that the IFS, the Centre for Public Policy and the Regions, that Citigroup were wrong. And finally, he said that the much celebrated Professor Hughes Hallett, the government's own economic adviser, was wrong, wrong, wrong. So, First Minister, how does it feel to be so misunderstood? <laughs> First Minister. Uh, can I, I correct, in fairness to the independent the Governor of the Bank of England, I have never said any such thing. Indeed, I have defended his speech, as indeed Mark Carney had to correct Tory MPs in the House of Commons who were similarly trying to misrepresent him as Ruth Davidson uh, has. Uh, can I also say, I'm not quite certain, is the CBI in or out of the Better Together campaign <laughs> uh, 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 at the present moment? But does she must? Well, maybe the Labour Party, with its strong connections historically. Can I get us on the latest information? But I, I do accept that, that I have a question mark about the OBR. I mean, see, right from the start, I, I believe that the Tories have used the OBR not just as part of government, but as part of the Conservative Party. I'm quoting directly from Alistair Darling in the Financial <laughs> Times of the 9th of July 2010. Now, can I just put it to Ruth Davison? If the leader of the Better Together campaign, until Murdo Fraser takes over, until <laughs> if the leader of the Better Together campaign believes that the OBR is an instrument of the Conservative Party, then am I not entitled to question when it gets all its forecasts wrong? And fundamentally, can the Conservative Party not realise some of the analysis uh, of Federal Fraser? <laughs> The analysis is that because you lack confidence 
in the people of Scotland and the economy of Scotland. The people of Scotland lack confidence in the Conservative Party. And as long as you continue to pursue this doom-laden nonsense, then you'll stay rock bottom of the Scottish opinion poll. Can I just say to the First Minister that we should use full names and not nicknames? Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Um, the appearance of a young man raised in Aberdeen in an ISIS recruitment video has shocked our Muslim community and all of the people of the city. Does the First Minister agree with me that the actions of one individual should not reflect on an entire community? And will he join with me in calling on all Aberdonians to continue to live together as good neighbours in peace and solidarity? First Minister. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that, as I, I believe and hope the whole chamber uh, agrees with that. One of the purposes of extremism uh, is to seek to divide communities. Radicalisation is something that we have been, continue to be constantly vigilant about. Uh, Police Scotland have been very active in monitoring that, but also active, of course, in engaging with and building strong relationships with the Muslim community. However, the actions of any individual, as Kevin Stewart rightly says, should not and must not be seen as reflecting in any way mainstream uh, opinion in any community of Scotland. We know from experience how well this country can react to such challenges, as the integrated community response to the attack on Glasgow Airport in 2007 showed Scotland at its very best. And I believe that all fair-minded people in Aberdeen and indeed across the country will support our zero-tolerance approach to any attempt to de demonise or encourage hate crime against the Muslim community or indeed any other minority group in Scotland. Question three, Karen Skips. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to Professor Dunleavy's report transitioning to a new Scottish state. First Minister. Well, I, I couldn't help but notice uh, in Ruth Davidson's long list of people that I disagree with, Professor Dunleavy had miraculously disappeared <laughs> from the list thanks to his report. That important contribution to the referendum debate. It vindicates, of course, the Scottish Government's position yeah. on the nature of transition to a fully independent Scotland, as pointed out in our White Paper. It blows out of the water, does Professor Dunleavy's report, the Treasury figure of £2.7 billion, widely briefed to the media, and neither Danny Alexander, nor the Prime Minister, nor Ruth Davidson have been able to give any satisfactory explanation for this. However, the Permanent Secretary to Treasury has stepped into the void. He has described it, Sir Nicholas McPherson, as a misbriefing of key, <laughs> of key data. I think it's about time we found out exactly how this misbriefing was allowed to happen. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for his reply. On page three of his report, Professor Dunleavy indicates that the main uncertainties surrounding setup and transition costs following the S-vote, and I quote, arise from the London government's apparent reluctance to do any planning for or to make clear to Scottish voters how transition to independence would be handled at their end. Does the First Minister agree that the UK government should immediately desist from issuing misleading figures and misinformation, some of which Professor Dunleavy described as bizarrely inaccurate and spectacularly wrong, and that the, and that the Prime Minister should come to Scotland and openly debate these issues? First Minister. Well, I have to say, and I'm quoting here directly from Professor Dunleavy's report, Whitehall has been forbidden to discuss issues with Scottish officials to do any contingency planning for independence in case the conclusion suggest independence would not cause major problems. So that is the analysis of the distinguished professor from the London School of Economics. And I do think the Better Together campaign, since they were quoting and citing Professor Dunleavy, the figure of 2.7 billion was meant to be Professor Dunleavy's figure. In fact, he's demolished it, accused the Treasury of exaggerating his work by a factor of 12. I think that was very generous of Professor Dunleavy. Usually their exaggerations are even greater than that. <laughs> Demolished their analysis, published his report. At what stage will any of the Unionist Party leaders or any person in the Better Together campaign have the decency yes. to accept and admit the misbriefing of Professor Dunleavy's work? Perhaps Murdo Fraser, <laughs> when he addresses his speech tonight, will address that very point. We wait with bated breath. <laughs> 
Thank you, President. Officer. Professor Dunleavy estimates the cost at £200 million if, amongst other things, command and control of defence forces is shared with the UK until 2020. Can the First Minister confirm if that is now Scottish Government policy? First Minister. Firstly, that is not uh, what Professor Dunleavy argued. And secondly, the member will find a full exposition of the defence costs and budget over the period in Chapter 6 of the White Paper. Just as it seemed to me unfortunate uh, that his colleague did not seem to have read the section on foreign representation and overseas representation in Chapter 6 of the White Paper when we were doing the question time last week, I find it doubly disappointing that that same chapter has not been read apparently by anyone in the Liberal Democrats. Do some reading, do some homework, and I'll see you after the recess. Drew Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I wonder if what the First Minister's response is to Professor Dunleavy's colleague Ian McLean, who does put the set-up costs at £1.5 to £2 billion, and he may want to go back and check uh, Professor Dunleavy's blog this morning. Does the First Minister not understand that the failure of his government to produce robust and comprehensive information about the cost estimates leaves the people of Scotland with the impression that the SNP would support independence regardless of the cost? First Minister. I, I think if the Labour Party had truly wanted to pursue this issue, in the sticky wicket in which they're now batting. We'd have heard something about it from Joanne Lamont earlier on today. But I don't actually have to respond to Professor Ian McLean. Incidentally, someone who believes in the scrapping of the Barnett formula, uh, and I will be interested to know how that is shared across the Better Together parties, I don't have to respond because Professor Dunleavy has already done yes, it yes. and looked at Ian McLean's work and suggested why Ian McLean has been led uh, astray. Now, given the obvious evidence that Professor Dunleavy's work, cited by the Better Together campaign and Danny Alexander, has been comprehensively demolished by Professor Dunleavy himself. In other words, given the source of the figure has said the figure was exaggerated by a factor of 12, at what stage will any of these parties yeah. accept that they got it wrong and owe a fundamental apology to the people of Scotland? Question four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government can take to tackle the proliferation of fixed odds betting terminals and payday lenders on the country's high streets. First Minister. Well, these, of course, uh, are action, direct action in these areas is reserved. However, within our powers, we are taking what action we can. Scottish ministers held a summit on the 23rd of April on payday lending and gambling, and the Minister for Local Government will be publishing the action plan which followed that summit very shortly. Uh, as a first step, the new Scottish planning policy put in place this week acknowledged concerns about the proliferation of payday lenders and fixed odds betting terminals in some high streets. Local authorities, through their town centre strategies, can develop policies to restrict such uses to protect the amenity of centres and, of course, the well-being of communities. However, I would argue in terms of direct action, it is one of the areas where we actually need the powers of this Parliament to extend over key areas which are affecting the social life of Scotland. I thank the First Minister for the answer and I welcome the publication of the document earlier this week. And I've met with former gamblers and also the Campaign for Fairer Gambling and tonight I'm going to be a guest at, the, at a GA meeting in Renfrewshire. These groups are firmly of the opinion that the only way to combat the issue of FOBTs is with a reduction in the maximum stakes uh, on these machines down to £2, which is something that I support. Does the First Minister agree with me that the UK Government must act now uh, to try to tackle the problem of these machines in our communities? And will he commit to raise the matter directly with the UK Government? First Minister. Well, we have already made representations to the UK Government over a substantial period of time expressing our concerns that developments such as the growth of fixed odds betting terminals. Most recently, a letter was sent on the 29th of May highlighting the risks to public health and calling for a more preventative approach to be taken. We will continue to press uh, for action, but on this and the other matters that the member raised, you will find on page 116 of the White Paper uh, our intention, once we have control of regulation and our approach to tougher regulation uh, for payday lenders in an independent Scotland. I hope that reassures the member that we are doing what we can within the powers we have, and we will seek to do more when this Parliament has the powers of an independent Parliament. Question five, Green to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to Police Scotland report management information year-end 2013-14. First Minister. Well, the, the Police Scotland management information gives a, a snapshot, as Graham Pearson knows, of the strong progress that it's made in its first year, with all parts of Scotland now enjoying the benefits of a single service. Our recorded crime in Scotland national statistics for 2012-13 show that recorded crime has decreased by 35 per cent 
since 2006-07, and it climbs its lowest level for 39 years, I think supported by the 1,000 additional police officers we have delivered compared to 2007. Now, police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority are working together to safeguard local policing and enhance access to the specialist resources, and now we are doing that against the backdrop of continuing Westminster austerity. I commend the police officers and the remaining police staff for the work they do on our behalf. Given the recent controversy over stop and search statistics, the First Minister might wish to know that for almost six months now I have asked for both the notes of guidance for crime recording, along with a briefing to understand the impacts of widening the use of subsuming crime and fixed penalty tickets on the reporting figures. I still await the briefing, which appears inordinately difficult to achieve after long delays. Will the First Minister enable a briefing at the earliest, recognising the need for public confidence in these figures? First Minister. Well, I, I, I don't accept that the, that the, uh, the uh, this recorded crime in Scottish national statistics uh, figures, people don't have confidence in. They are kite marked figures from national statistics. And I don't think Graham Pearson should question them. I mean, they are, after all, uh, the same basis of figures uh, which the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats used when, when they were uh, in power. So I don't see any reason for questioning the, the basis of these figures now. But what I shall do, uh, if he writes to me detailing the areas which he has raised with the Police Authority and Police Scotland, uh, I shall write to him to see what further information can be provided. But, you know, in acknowledging the contribution of the police officers and the additional 1,000 police officers who I think have made a substantial contribution to the lowest crime levels in Scotland for 39 years. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think we should... Well, we say it is across the world. We only need to, to glance south of the border to see that they have lost, over the last three years, as many officers as the total complement of the Scottish police force in Scotland. And I do believe that the decline in crime figures in Scotland is due to the hard work of the extra police officers we have in the streets and communities of Scotland. And everybody knows that they wouldn't be there if the Labour Party had been maintained in power. Responses to remarks made by the Chief Executive of the NHS regarding the movement of emergency patients. First Minister. We uh, agree with them, uh, which is not that surprising given that Paul Gray is both Chief Executive of NHS Scotland and the Scottish Government's Director General of Health and Social Care. Mando Fraser. Well, I, I think I asked the Minister what his response was. I'm not sure I heard one. But given, given that there's a large influx of visitors expected to Scotland for the Commonwealth Games, how confident is the First Minister that they already under strain NHS will be able to cope with the additional demand, and what extra resources are being made available to help avoid even greater delays at A&E departments than we currently have? First Minister. Well, I have already pointed out that uh, we are working to improve the 93 per cent figure in accident and emergency, but I have also pointed out that is rather greater than the 87 per cent figure, which was hailed as a success uh, in 2006. The planning for the Commonwealth Games is very much part of the Commonwealth Games structure. We are absolutely confident that we can cope with any contingency in terms of the performance of the National Health Service in Scotland, as indeed I know Murdo Fraser will wish to acknowledge in terms of response to the Clutha tragedy that the National Health Health Service responded exceptionally well, and that is part of the planning for the, uh, the Commonwealth Games. But I know that Murdo Fraser will be the first to understand the point that was made by Brian Keithley, uh, that within the constraints of the Barnett formula, even when you resource health in real terms, that is a constraint. That is presumably why he is trying to break out of that straitjacket in his enunciation of a federal solution. There is a difficulty, of course, that when Murdo Fraser was in favour of more devolution, Ruth Davison had a line in the sand. When Ruth Davison is in favour of more devolution, Murdo has moved to federalism. And when Murdo moves and Ruth moves to federalism, no doubt Murdo Fraser will move towards supporting independence. <laughs> but I'm confident that the independence campaign will survive that endorsement and go to victory on September the 18th. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members should leave the chamber, should do so quickly and quietly.